left last time, I had asked you to, um, I'd ask you to um, work on these examples of neurons. For example, we did this one in class. I'd ask you to go through and choose the right term for that one, and then the ones that follow on your half sheet, which I'd ask you to keep from last time. There's five examples here. There's that one. That one, that one, and this one. Well, anyways, to check you on that, uh, I wanted to do a Kahoot. It's a class response system we could do. It's not for points or anything. But if you have a smartphone, get it out. If you don't have one, just watch along. But what you want to do is open up your browser on your phone right now. Let's see if I can show you what I mean here. I got this little Kahoot quiz. What we can do online, you can respond, I can see if you pick the right answer. Play. Classic. So what you got to do, you open your browser, uh, if you don't have the app, I don't think you do, go to kahoot.it on your browser, and just enter in that pin, and you'll join, and I'll Enter your name, and I mean, don't give your full name, maybe just your first name. And I'll see you pop up on that screen there. And I'll wait till like high 20s join, and then we'll play. You don't have to play, this isn't for points. I just want to check you on those half sheet questions. I think you should know the answer. Once enough people have joined, I'll hit start, and you'll see how to play. It's, it's pretty self-explanatory. This is more popular in K-12, but uh, it works just as good with college students. All right, 22, let's, let's go. You can join at any time, but let's go start. I'll give you 30 seconds for questions, just kind of read that. And on your phone, that's the question. A neuron carrying signals away from the bicep brachii causing it to contract is, and you choose the right response on your phone. Questions up here. And you choose one of these choices. Is it visceral sensory, visceral motor? Is it somatic sensory, somatic motor? And Time is running out. Actually, I guess I should have given more time. Of those who answered, it got it right. That is an example of somatic motor, a neuron carrying signals from the biceps, uh, from the CNS to the biceps, causing it to contract the somatic motor. So now that you know how the game is played, the next four is uh, answer more quickly. A neuron carrying signals away from the CNS to the heart, increasing heart rate. What would you put for that one? That is visceral motor, sympathetic, increasing heart rate is the key. So most of you put parasympathetic. Um, that's incorrect. What would make that parasympathetic if you're talking about heart rate? Decrease. It would decrease heart rate. That's why that is incorrect. So I'm glad we're going through this. We're not getting it quite yet. Let's do the next one. 
You feel a hot candle burning your skin. What is that? Somatic sensory. Feel and anything that's skin related is pretty much somatic sensory. Void your bladder. What is that? Visceral motor parasympathetic. That's just, yeah, okay. Well, so you got it. Okay, some of you aren't. Okay, but anyways, anything where you command your body to do something, is that sensory or motor? <coughs> anything when you command your body to do something is a motor activity. That's why sensory cannot be correct for those of you who responded sensory. And it just happens to be, I guess you wouldn't know this unless you remembered it from the notes. Void your bladder is a parasympathetic response. So, what do you think holding it in? The opposite would be sympathetic. Okay, they kind of oppose each other. All right, let's move on. We've got one more here. You feel the bread muffin. You ate digest in your stomach. The key word is feel. You feel something, is that sensory or motor? Go ahead and select. Okay, it's pretty evenly split between sensory, okay, you got that. But when you, it's your digestive system, your organs, visceral, okay? Mm -hmm. So visceral sensory is the correct answer. Remember, for somatic sensory, it's anything involving skin, touch, feel, you know, step on a nail. Um, that's pretty much somatic sensory. So I'm glad I do that. You know, they, they keep score, I, I really don't, but, um, we do have a winner. I didn't bring any prizes. Maybe next time I will. Sorry. Uh, but I think some of you um, still have to study that. Okay? Um, study those categories of neurons. And uh, maybe if you missed class last time, let, let me show you what, what I'm talking about here. Let me get back to the PowerPoints. this table. I, this is the last thing I taught in class on Friday, so um, take a look at it more and, and study the examples they give on this figure and I think you'll be okay. Uh, I need to move on though. All right, so talking about nervous tissue, if you look at nervous tissue, it can either be categorized as great matter, gray matter or white matter on fresh dissection, just looking at the tissue, it's gray or white. And what the slide says, gray tissue is gray because it contains all the, all the neuron cell bodies. Gray because it contains mostly um, neuron cell bodies. And white matter. It 
contains the parts of the cells that are myelinated. Contains myelinated axons. Now I show you a picture of a, a slice of spinal cord. That's part of the central nervous system. The brain, however, it's flipped. The gray matter is on the outside and the white matter is on the inside. So that's kind of the gross level, just looking at tissue, gray matter, white matter. In terms of the histology, we like to talk about cells. Um, so in terms of the histology, we talk about the neurons and the glial cells. We spend most of the time talking about the physiology of the neuron in terms of cell type because the neuron is the main functional cell of the nervous system. Neurons are excitable cells. And that's mostly what we teach students in physiology, like how, how are these cells excitable and how, how can we stimulate other cells? Excitable cells, they can generate electrical signals. The glial cells, they actually outnumber the neurons something like 10 to 1. There's many more of them, but they're not more important. They're more of a supportive role. Glial cells, there's many different kinds. We'll go through them. They're, they're not excitable. Okay. Non excitable cells. Supportive function. Book does a good job of outlining um, the, the variety of supportive functions. So just to go through them, um, here they are. Here, just as a list for you, we'll go through them one, one at a time. Oh, by the way, I went too fast there. Each cell is either going to be involved in a supportive role for nerves or parts of nerves in the CNS or the PNS. That's what's in parentheses there. Okay. Let's remember that um, if you're in the CNS, you're in the protective casing of the skull, the cranium, or the vertebral column. If you're in the peripheral nervous system, those nerves are outside those bony cases. That's what we said the last time. Astrocytes, I think that's my first slide there. Uh, it's a good picture. I like these pictures, and I have some descriptions here. They're the most abundant CNS neuroglia, which is another name for glial cell. So they're a CNS glial cell. And what they do, the picture shows them these little, well, they're parts of the cell. They call them paravascular feet. See how they're wrapping around the capillaries? Um, that's a very important function. Paravascular feet wrap around. Capillaries. No, capillaries are blood vessels. Um, whole blood is actually toxic to the brain. Now, all capillaries, they kind of filter to different tissues to supply oxygen and fluids. But in the brain, we really limit that filtration. And so, by wrapping around the capillaries, you, you limit um, the molecules that are released to the tissue by the flowing blood. And so they actually call that the blood-brain barrier for that reason. So parabascular feet wrap around capillaries, creating a blood-brain barrier. So not much can escape the blood vessel because 
of how the perivascular feet wrap around uh, the capillaries. So what you create is um, the central nervous system interstitium. This is all the fluids surrounding the cells. It, it's kind of protected from whole blood. Okay. kind of harmful to the tissue. Uh, the other thing is there, oh, I'll just list this because I have it on the slide. They also recycle neurotransmitters. Microglial cells um, may appear thorny and they keep nervous tissue uh, sterile. Okay, they're phagocytes. So I'm writing microglial cells, phagocytic function. Epidymal cells, they're like an epithelial lining, and they create what's called a blood CSF barrier. different from the blood brain barrier I just erased actually. The blood CSF barrier, CSF is a filtration of blood. Okay. So in this picture, there's some a lot of blood vessels. And you filter the blood and on this side is the CSF and on say the other side would be blood. So basically, it's CSF is a filtration of blood, and it is what circulates around the brain and the uh, nervous tissues instead of blood. Because remember, whole blood is toxic to the brain. And so the reason these are there is they're, they're creating the CSF. When blood is filtered through this line of cells, maybe water and oxygen and glucose can get through, and that's the CSF, and that is what circulates around the entire brain, brain stem, and spinal cord. So imagine, it's hard to picture when, when I just say it. Here's the brain, looks like a boxer's glove. Here's the spinal cord, brain stem. <coughs> the cerebellum behind there. Well, anyway, we'll learn the major divisions of the CNS later. This is just a lecture on neural tissue. I want you to know that there's actually all these different connective tissue membranes called the meninges that surround the central nervous system. Look at all this red line. Pia mater. means intimate mother. The black line is the nervous tissue. The pia mater is connective tissue that kind of um, is a membrane around it. And in fact, they call these uh, meninges. Subarachnoid mater. The 
there's a really tough outer layer called the dura mater. What's the outermost layer? And it's um, a word that means tough mother. Okay, So it goes intimate mother, tough mother outside, and the pia mater on the inside. These are the three meningeal layers. The CSF is, is called um, the cerebral spinal fluid, and it circulates deep to the subarachnoid matter in a space called the subarachnoid space. Let me write that down. CSF. Cerebral spinal fluid, it's a filtration of blood. It circulates in the subarachnoid space. So, oh, see, 10 CSF is blue, so I'll draw like blue all within the subarachnoid space that circulates with there. It's created when blood is filtered through this epithelial lining called ependymal cells. CSF is created when blood is filtered <coughs> through epidymal cells. And that's the glial cell I'm, I'm teaching. There's two places in the brain where this happens. Uh, well, the name of the structure where this blood is filtered is called the, the choroid plexus. I think that actually is a term to look up. Choroid, C-H-O-R-O-I-D, plexus. It's a complex network of blood vessels where you have these ependymal cells. And you filter the blood and create the CSF that circulates and bathes the entire <coughs> central nervous system. So instead of blood, you got CSF. It's really important. If you suspect an infection of the meningeal layers, it's, it's called meningitis, right? You do spinal tap. And what are you tapping? You're trying to tap, for analytical purposes, into this layer. You go between the vertebra. You puncture um, that space and get a sample of CSF. And if there's no infection, the, the liquid should be crystal clear. If it's cloudy, there's an infection, and maybe you can treat it. Uh, well, anyways, the whole point was to teach you what ependymal cells were, but you have to appreciate what CSF is to kind of know that. And any questions on any of that? There's a better picture of CSF circulating. I'm not really going to teach that till later in the course, but if you're curious, I'll give you a page number here. This is the book we're using, right? Let's see here. I guess it's going to be in the brain chapter. Page 466 has this. <coughs> Easy. If you want to look it up. Can I see the pictures like I look for it in the other editions of the book? Yeah, it's there. And you can look at this later and find it in your edition. Awesome. Or just look up choroid plexus in the index. I'm, I'm sure you'll find it. I'm going to move on. Um,
curious. You don't have to share, but has anyone ever had a spinal tap? It's kind of a rare procedure. I've heard that when you get a spinal tap and you remove even a little bit of that fluid, your brain starts hitting the skull a lot easier and you start getting headaches just from like sitting up. That, that extra fluid surrounding your brain is very important for protection. Okay, next glial cell. Boom. Illegal dendrocytes. Um, they have processes that form myelin sheaths around CNS nerve fibers. So they basically myelinate axons of the CNS. Oligodendrocytes. Axons of CNS neurons. Remember, myelination helps speed up uh, the conduction velocity of the nerve impulse. So we had said that before. A couple of um, cells shown here. There's satellite cells, and then there's the Schwann cell. The satellite cells hover like moons around the cell body. That's why they got the name satellite cell. These purple cells surrounding the cell body of the neuron. Then each of these, they color them light blue, is a cell called the Schwann cell providing the myel myelination. So each of these is its own cell wrapping around the axon. Cells. Um, I believe they help recycle the neurotransmitter as well. Because let's remember that that's where you would have a lot of the synapses on the cell body. Help recycle neurotransmitter, satellite cells, and swan cell. Myelinate the axons of PNS neurons. <coughs> we did talk about different types of neurons on Friday. Is that a sensory or a motor one? The one that's shown on the slide. Sensory or motor, what do you think? It is sensory. Sino uh, unipolar is what we called it. So go back and look at your notes if you've forgotten that. You'll see it there. Anyways, this is uh, the process of myelination. And what you see is it's pretty much just multiple layers of cell membrane that have wrapped around a segment of an axon. Wrapping, wrapping. That's essentially what we're showing you there. Here's a real picture of it. The axon is shown in the middle, and um, the myelin sheath is many layers of cell membrane. Cell membrane is a phospholipid. It's very fatty, so you, you force the um, nerve impulse to kind of skip over it because you cannot have any... Um, current flowing across the cell membrane through these many layers of cell membrane. So, like, is that like what the nodes and brain area that you're talking about? Yes, that, that's right. So the gaps between these um, myelin sheaths are called the nodes of Radenbier. Yeah. So the interpreter? Nodes of what, I'm sorry? Oh, let me write on the board there. Node of Ranvier, R-A-N-V-I-E-R. There will be the gaps, so like if I see the nerve fiber, where you, where you can actually see it exposed, that's the node of Ranvier. Okay. Schwann cell allows the jump. Yeah. Okay. You kind of force the signal to jump from node to node. That speeds up the nerve impulse signal.
That's it for these slides. I'm going to open up the next slides. Membrane potential. That's pretty much the major topic of this unit. <coughs> Membrane potential. Today, an action potential for Wednesday. Membrane potential, we're talking about um, the excitable cells, the neurons. If you're in an excitable cell, I guess there's kind of two states you could be in. The neurons. You could either be in a state of rest, or you could be in a state where you're stimulated, you're, you're responding in some way. We're talking about this one first. This is the condition of rest in the cell. And we talked about different parts of the cell. And what part is this that they're kind of probing? It's the axon. And they're kind of showing you. They're just showing you the difference in charge across the cell membrane. And you can actually measure it. Okay. Um, all right, so I have Ohm's law there, current voltage resistance, or this. Uh, you learn about it in your first year of physics. Well, if you don't take physics, um, you at least should know conceptually what the terms mean. In this class, well, when we talk about voltage, it's kind of like the potential difference in charge between two points. <coughs> Basically, well, for us, the two points are inside the membrane and outside the membrane, right? So we got set up there. cell membrane that is of the axon inside membrane outside membrane if there is a difference in charge the convention is with respect to the inside okay. so if you measure on your voltmeter as they do a potential of negative 70 millivolts is more negative on the inside compared to the outside. I mean, you're literally just measuring the charge difference from here to here. I mean, you're not even measuring the charge difference on the inside and the outside. Just the difference on the membrane. As far as I know, the inside of the um, cell is the same as the outside. It's like zero. There's no difference. But across the cell membrane, it's like it's negative seven. Okay, so that's an important distinction to make. Whenever you have a charge difference, it's like they're attracted to each other across the cell membrane, but the charges cannot flow because you can't get past the hydrophobic zone. I think I tried to teach that chapter three. Uh, so that concept is 
important here, you know. Unless you have a channel, right? Well, so we'll talk about a lot of those. But, but so far, this is the condition of rest. It's negative 70. Remember what I said before? Do, do you call this equilibrium? Yes or no? The answer is no. This is not equal. Students always want to say that because you think rest is like the cell is, oh, it's in equilibrium. But actually, rest is, uh, the negative is, is negative on the inside with respect to the outside. That's not equilibrium. What would equilibrium be? What would that number be if it was really equilibrium? <coughs> Zero. And it's not. So keep that in mind. The condition of rest is negative 70. And um, well, we do uh, have to talk about a lot how you establish rest and membrane potential. Continuous and saltatory for the uh, conduction, and that's the action potential. And those are have to do with this. Okay. Um, we're talking about this one. Okay. Yeah. Oop, let's see here. Let's see. Um, I'm going to read from my slide here. A neuron at rest has an excess amount of positive charge on the outside of the membrane and an excess of negative charge on the inside. So when we measure resting membrane potential, we usually read something like negative 70 millivolts. Okay. So the resting membrane potential is established by many potassium leak channels. Establishing this number, negative 70, I, I say as easy as 1, 2, 3, A, B, C. This is something I came up with. I mean, really, it's what I came up with to say, how am I going to teach this to students? I want students to understand how this number is established. Okay. And, all right, so think of it this way. Say you have a membrane, and we know that it's negative on the inside, it's positive on the outside, and that the ions cannot flow. Okay, but if ions could flow past the membrane, you call that current. Current is literally the charges flowing across the membrane. Um, so let's also remember that the inside of the cell. That's in, that's out, it's negative. There's other things inside the cell that contribute to the negativity, like proteins, PRO. Proteins usually carry a negative charge as well. But let's remember that um, what we had said before, for potassium and for sodium, Potassium is a positive ion that lives inside the cell. Okay. And there's more potassium on the inside than the outside. So I'll put a small k on the outside to symbolize there's less potassium on the outside. So that's one of the important ions we have to talk about in establishing resting membrane potential. I should probably list that as a title for this part of the lesson. Establishing. Membrane potential. This will be the next 45 minutes of your life. It takes a while to explain all the details. Um, so when we studied the sodium potassium ATPase pump, not only did we talk about potassium, we talked about sodium too. And do you remember how we said that the gradient was flipped? Well, it, I, what I mean is. There's less sodium on the inside and more sodium on the outside. We did say that before. So there's less sodium on the inside. 
and there's more sodium on the outside. Should be review. We kind of discussed this before. If you didn't, just and now you're reminded. Okay, there's more sodium um, on the outside than on the inside. So if there was a channel for sodium to flow through, you can you consider the concentration gradient. Wouldn't sodium flow into the cell if it could? The answer is yes. But what about for potassium? If there was a channel for it to flow through, would it flow in or out? Potassium would flow out, out. if there, there was a um, channel for it to flow through. That is correct. So let's consider that first point. There's a lot of um, channels for potassium in neurons. <coughs> in neurons, there are many potassium leak channels. What physiologists love to say is that these cells are permeable to potassium. These cells are permeable to potassium ions. If they have a channel for it, they're permeable permeable to it. That's kind of the way they phrase it. So let's kind of like um, build this thing here. Look, so we know that resting membrane potential is uh, negative 70 millivolts. And let's put um, a potassium leak channel in here. Which way would potassium leak in or out? It's just going to follow its concentration gradient. Okay. It will leak out. So I'll draw some balls leaking out. Okay, so, so again, consider um, for every ion, you have to consider the electro, electrochemical gradient. a leak channel and potassium is leaking out, would that make the inside of the cell more negative or less negative if a, a positive ion is leaving? It makes it more negative. Okay. So um, here, here's kind of how we phrase this. For every potassium that leaves, get one excess negative charge in inside. You get one excess negative charge inside. Does that make sense? Because by definition, <laughs> With one left, and there's one more, one positive left, there's one more negative left on the inside. Okay, so it, think of it this way that excess negative charge, it like, it wants to pull that positive potassium back in. This excess negative charge wants to pull positive potassium 
back in. You know, it's leaking out, but it's like as it gets more negative in there, it's that negative, excess negative charge, it wants to pull the positive back in. Um, that's the um, um, electrical gradient, okay? Because they're both working at the same time. You have a concentration gradient, and you have an electrical gradient, and they're working at the same time. That's why this is one thing, and that's the other. The chemical gradient is just high to low. But the electrical gradient is these ions carry a charge. That's why I wanted to write this part on there. So if you let the ion flow until the potassium concentration gradient, CONC, equals potassium's electrical gradient, they exactly counterbalance each other. And you actually measure the potential at that time. Call it voltage, you know, potassium EQ, equilibrium. You measure negative 90. Let me write that more clear. This is called the equilibrium potential. for potassium equals negative 90 millivolts. So that's if it was just potassium there. That would be negative 90, not negative 70. Okay. So we have to have this exact same conversation for, for sodium as well. Now before I erase this, are there any questions on this little paragraph here? Well, Good, let me, let me add to the picture here. A sodium leak channel. This red one is a potassium leak channel, but let me add a sodium leak channel. It only leaks sodium. So sodium, because of the concentration gradient, will sodium leak out or leak in? It will leak in. That's its concentration gradient. So this is sodium. It's a, it's a leak channel. Turns out there, there's many more of the potassium ones, and there's less of the sodium ones. But anyways, let me um, talk about the equilibrium potential for potassium. For potassium or sodium? I'm sorry, for sodium. Yeah, so let's talk about equilibrium potential for sodium. For every sodium that enters, Now you have um, one excess negative charge on the outside. Right? You get one excess negative charge on the outside. So that excess negative charge wants to pull sodium back out. That excess negative charge wants to pull that sodium back out. So the same deal, right? Just in reverse as before. And well, if you let the sodium flow until the sodium concentration gradient is like equal and opposite to the electrical gradient, if you let sodium flow until 
sodium concentration gradient equals sodium's electrical gradient, and you, you would measure an equilibrium potential for sodium of plus 66 millivolts. Sodium equilibrium potential. Plus 66. So what that means is the plus is the inside of the cell more positive or more negative if that's the number, plus 66. Remember, it's always with respect to the inside, right? So that means the inside of the cell is super positive. It's at that point that sodium will stop leaking in. Okay? That's if sodium was there, this sodium leak channel was there all by itself, but it's not. Both of these channels are there. Okay. I started off by telling you the correct answer. What's the resting membrane potential? Negative 70. If you add potassium leak channels, um, let's, let's start over. Let, let's pretend you don't know that. You know it, but pretend you don't. Let's go back to the beginning. Let's start with uh, our potassium leak channels. If you let potassium flow until it reaches its equilibrium, What's the number? What's the equilibrium potential for potassium? Negative? No. For potassium? Negative 90. Negative 90, yeah. OK, now add the sodium leak channels. It's going to make it, not because they're both there together at the same time. What it'll do is, some will leak in, it'll bring this number a little less negative, a little more positive to negative 70. Yeah. Does that make sense? Because they're both there at the same time. The whole equilibrium potential thing is just if that leak channel was there by itself in a cell. Okay. But the cells are permeable to both. It's mostly permeable to potassium. That's why um, the resting membrane potential is, is much closer to the uh, potassium equilibrium because it's more permeable to it. The sodium leak just makes it a little more positive. Okay. So you got all this leaking happening, and this is largely responsible for the resting membrane potential that we observe in a cell before you stimulate it. Um, okay. However, this is kind of where I have to kind of do this using the one, two, three, A, B, C thing. You have to maintain these ion and gradients. Um, basically, if these just kept leaking, uh, Eventually, you would destroy the concentration gradients that you've established here. Low, high, um, low, high for potassium and for sodium. So um, these passive forces of leak are important, but you have to maintain the um, ionic gradients. So, Yeah, exactly. So th this leak establishes um, negative 70, not equilibrium. But if you just let each of these keep leaking, you would destroy this number, right? So you have to counteract the leak. The leak establishes this. Then you need one more molecule to maintain um, this number and these concentration gradients. So my point is, number one, to maintain a steady resting membrane potential,
right, that's our negative 70. You have to maintain the ionic gradients of sodium and potassium. So you're going to have to counteract the leak. You must maintain the ionic gradients of sodium and potassium. Point number two. Um, the pa the, this passive leak of sodium and potassium, it establishes that negative 70, but it would eventually dissipate the ionic gradients and destroy resting membrane potential. The passive leak of sodium and potassium, it would dissipate ionic gradients. I'll just say destroy, easier word to understand. The passive leak would destroy ionic gradients. Of course that doesn't happen. I said it, it would destroy it, but it doesn't. Because you have to add one more molecule, and you already studied it. It's the sodium potassium ATPase bond, right? Um, it stabilizes the resting membrane potential by maintaining those um, ionic gradients. So that's by point number three. Sodium, potassium, ATPase pump. Maintains potassium, sodium, gradients. So here's a picture of it. What does this pump maintain? I already answered the question. It maintains the ionic gradients of sodium and potassium. I think we spend a lot of time studying this. Do you remember how it like you you're kind of like taking the sodium that leaks in and you're just throwing it back out. And all the potassium that leaks out, you recapture it. Okay, so let's kind of write that down. Okay. Sodium potassium uh, ATPase uh, pump. It works with the leak channels to kind of like maintain the ionic gradients. And it's at a, a three to two ratio. So let's say you have three sodiums leak in. This ejects them back out. Two potassiums leak out, the pump recaptures them. So let's, you know, this is basically the, the review of the pump. Uh, point A. What did I just say? 
How many potassiums leak out? Three. Oh, two. Two, sorry. Two potassiums leak out, and you the pump recaptures them. I'll just write two potassium ions leak out, pump recaptures. Okay. And then uh, three sodiums leak in, and you just eject it from the cell. Sodium ions leak in, pump, ejects them. Point B. Essentially, you exactly balanced the passive forces of leak. Pump exactly balances the passive forces of leak. So my last point is, what's the number when you measure it? Negative? Seven. Okay, well, that's kind of the whole point of this. This is not equilibrium, it's you know, negative with respect to the inside, and um, it's the condition of rest. You haven't even stimulated the cell yet. All this to explain, you've done nothing. But this is the, the, the condition of an excitable cell. You have to have this charge difference, so when you do stimulate, positive can flow in, and you depolarize this polarized state of negative 70. Now, uh, there's a lot of figures from textbooks, and I include a set of them there, that uh, as you go back and review this, or maybe just watch the YouTube video again, for, they, they want to show you the importance of this um, equilibrium potential for sodium and for potassium. This figure here is showing you the equilibrium potential for potassium, and they show you all the numbers that we talked about, like this one here. <coughs> negative 70, and they have different arrows. One is for the chemical gradient, and one is for the electrical gradient, okay? If you're a positive potassium, you want to leak out, because there's more potassium on the inside than the outside. The electrical gradient, it's like it points in, because if you're a positive ion, you see it's negative on the inside. You want to go there, uh, but you can't. And notice that these forces aren't equal. That, that's why this arrow is um, bigger. So what we said was, if you just let the potassium flow until the forces are exactly equal, right? until the chemical gradient force out is equal and opposite to the force in, and you measure that equilibrium just for potassium, it's negative 90. Now they do the same thing for sodium. Sodium, it wants to flow into the cell because its concentration gradient and electrical gradient are both pointing in the same direction. Okay, positive sodium. If you just let the sodium flow until the electrical gradient wants to keep the sodium out, it has to get very positive, plus 66. That's what we were saying. So what I tried to draw on the board is that the, the pump is exactly counteracting the leak of both, because they're both in the cell. It shows the two leaking out of the potassiums being recaptured, and it shows the three sodiums leaking in being pumped out. So our resting membrane potential is uh, negative 70. The figure in the Marriott book, they kind of do the thing where you kind of build um, by first considering only potassium leak channels. Remember the number is negative 90 because that's the equilibrium potential for that. But then if you then add the sodium 
that makes it a little less negative because some sodium is leaking in. And then they add, finally, let's add a pump to compensate for the leaking ion. And this is the strategy I, I try to teach. Right? So if you had a problem following me, just keep studying this figure until it finally makes sense to you. Sometimes I just have to say that. If you don't get it now, just keep studying until you do. And if at some point, um, you will. You will get it. Um, and if you don't, I, I included a video here. I don't know if that's going to work. Look for this as an AMP flicks on the um, Mastering AMP site. That can help you understand that. I want to take a break, and when we come back, we'll talk about when you actually stimulate the cell, what happens. So come back at 9 o'clock, about 15 minutes.